Welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is someone who is currently hanging tough. It's Anande Boletus. There you go. That, that wasn't bad, Mark. <laughs> so I watched this movie in 2010, and I remember my first experience with it. I was sitting in a theater, and this is after the happening and some of M. Night's duds that had just been released. And I watched this trailer, I'm like, this looks really good. But then it said, produced by M. Night Shyamalan. And everyone in the, not everyone in the theater, but a big handful of people in the theater started laughing. And I, uh. I kind of thought to myself, oh, this movie's in trouble. Because they were thinking about the happening, and they were thinking about other things. So this is a movie that, it was just his story. I mean, someone else wrote this, uh, you know, other people directed it. But I think everyone just associated this movie with M. Night Shyamalan. But I think... You know, the screenplay by Brian Nelson, the direction by John Eric Dowdle, I think it holds up. And I think this is a good movie. Yeah, that, me too. I really liked it. I was pleasantly surprised because I didn't actually hear anything about this movie. It kind of just popped up on my radar and I was like, oh, cool. Nice little horror. 80 minutes. Oh, it's perfect. Nice and short. It, it was perfect. I mean, it's like a little short story that they made into a film and they didn't try and make it like this long saga which I don't think it would have fit at all because, I mean, it's basically this parable story that the narrator tells and the story just gets embodied with these people getting stuck on an elevator with Lucifer, Lucifer in a lift. <laughs> oh, that would have been a great alternate title. Right? Oh, my God. Lucifer, Lucifer in a lift. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What's better, <laughs> Devil or Lucifer in a lift? I mean, I do like the title, like, just Devil. Mm -hmm. It's so devilish. <laughs> And the tie, and the the but the V is a down button on an elevator. Yeah, yeah, me, no, that's excellent. It makes me so happy. And also, this movie. Did you catch all the like religious uh, mentions in here? Like all the not Easter eggs, but just all the mentions of everything in here. Did you did you catch all those? Mm, I actually don't know if I did. I didn't really go and check if I did. I catched a lot of it I, because, I, I, like, I mean, they weren't really subtle about no <laughs> about any of the religious stuff. Yeah. This movie is incredibly earnest and completely mm. unsubtle. And I think that's what I love about it. It's just such a... I mean, he throws... He drops toast on the ground. Yep, the devil's here. Like, it's just so earnest, all of it. And I love it. And it makes me so happy. In the beginning, the jumper who jumps out of the building to open up room for the devil to come to earth to torture souls and have the devil's meeting, he falls on a Bethel bread, like Bethel. And then you have, like, Bethlehem Pike. Then you have Trinity Car Wash. Uh, you have 333 Locust Street, which is, you know, half of 666 and Locust, which were unleashed in the plague. So you have yeah. all these interesting little things. And I loved the red on all five of the characters that are in the, the lift, too. I dug that about mm. it. I don't know. You, mm. And did you notice this? Bokey and Woodbine. Not, Bokey and Woodbine. Not everything you said. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> There's so many little. I'm telling you, I was so excited watching this movie. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Ah! Um, I'm a nerd. But yeah, oh, so, so like Bokeem Woodbine, he plays Ben Larson in this movie, right? He yeah. he has red stars on his lapels. Every other guard that works for Caraway Security has gold stars. What? Yeah. And then you have, uh, the, you know, the old woman who turns out to be the devil. She she has red hair. So, she, like, they're saying gingers are evil, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sarah Caraway, her fingernails were, were painted red. Vince the, yeah. the, Vince, the salesman, the mattress salesman, had the red tie. And then uh, Tony, played by Logan Marshall Green, he's so good at being tortured looking, Logan Marshall Green, he had a red, uh, his bag was red. So everyone had little elements of red to them. And I loved how they snuck it in there. And just, I think, I know I'm talking a lot, but this movie really rewards repeat viewings. And I think that's why I keep watching it. Plus, in fact, it's 80 minutes long, which is amazing. Yeah, it's like a quick watch. You can, you know, like take a long lunch and watch your, yourself some devil. I mean, but you're <laughs> blowing my mind right now with this. Yeah, I didn't even pick that up. Do you want that's me to, great. Do you want me to keep going? Please, no, please. Uh, talk away. Uh, please. Be, a fa be a, the fanboy that you are, Mark. Do I it. All right, so, and also when they go into the things like don't sit under the apple tree, you know, Adam and Eve with the apple. Of course. And yeah, then, yeah. Like, I, I love that part. And then the beginning, I, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but there's a guy cleaning the floor and he lifts up his, the floor cleaner and he pulls out something from the middle, which maybe could be like this, you know, the rings of hell, the circles of hell coming through. That's a, that's a stretch. But I kind of dug that. And I also saw some interesting things in regards to Constantine, the movie with Keanu Reeves. So I know the Devil's Meeting yeah. was around long before the, the comic book of Constantine. But Chris Messina is a detective who lost his family and he became 
an alcoholic who was going to kill himself. And then you have Constantine, who wears the same suit, black tie, jacket in the movie. And then also Logan Marshall Green in the elevator kind of looks like Constantine does in the comic books. So you have this really neat little crossover world full of possibilities that I really liked. Mark, this is excellent. This is all really good. I'm loving it. And I, I, like it also, I also had this thing with Constantine because I kept thinking, which devil do I like more? Like Peter Stormare or do I like this old lady doing the devil thing? Because she was freaking scary with those black eyes at the end. Yes, like that was well done. I liked her. I think she's my, I think she's my second favorite devil. Who's your first favorite? Peter Stormare. Oh yeah, from he, Constantine. He is so yeah. good. So good. I mean, I think he's everyone's favorite devil. Like he's, yeah, I think it's pretty much universally known that he's the best. Yeah, if you did a list of top 10 favorites, he would probably be number one just from the aggregate mm -hmm. ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so Tilda Swinton's in that movie. Constantine has a bunch of Oscar winners and excellent actors. Jesus. Yeah, I'm a big Constantine fan. Like, I really, really loved how they did that. Big that's, fan. That's one of our more popular episodes, actually. It just keeps getting listens. People love them some Constantine. And there's like, three, nice. there's about three commentaries on that Blu-ray. So there's tons of stuff if you want to research more of it. I dig mm -hmm. it. Okay. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. So at the end, everybody, Messina, Ramirez, and Logan Marshall Green's character, Tony, they all realize that the devil is real. So when the devil leaves at the end, the devil doesn't wipe the footage. So is it going to be common knowledge that the devil is in this world? Well, I kind of like saw it more. I, people are probably just going to think, you know, it's been crazy. Because when they actually get to the left in the end, they're keeping on yelling, oh, she got away, she got away. So I think it'll probably, you know, like, become lore, if you will. Uh, but yeah, I mean, some of them definitely found their faith or whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, it's like, I think it's probably one of those just too crazy of a story to tell. Yeah, you can't really beat a bar and tell somebody that story. You know, they're going to really like, look at you all funny. <laughs> Which story do you think people would believe? You are, let's see, you are LL Cool J from Deep Blue Sea, or you are... Chris Messina, the detective from this, and you have to make people believe one of the stories. Which one sounds more realistic? <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, because the thing is, I guess it can be easy to just spin a story. Like my thing with with this uh, uh, with Devil's ending with the old woman, because it's like an old woman. You know, it's like the last person you think would massacre five people in an elevator like that. But then it's like, oh, is it? <laughs> it, it you know? I yeah. mean, stranger things have happened. So I guess, like, I'll be someone that would spin it that way, you know? Like, I would believe, no, it's not the devil. It's this old lady, and she's just, like, super freakishly strong and cutthroats and, like, I don't know what, like... A ninja. <laughs> it's, it's woman, you know, or something, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? If, which story I had to tell to make people believe? Mm. Um, I would love that. Well, the Deep Blue Sea one, I guess you'd have the massive scar on your side from the shark. So that one might be more believable, right? Yeah. All right. So I guess it'd be tougher to explain the devil one. But I like, so you're telling me like a 65 year old ninja woman wiped out four people in an elevator <laughs> and then disappeared. Yeah. And did you notice the way that she needles at everybody in this movie? So she's the one who instigates in the beginning. Yeah, like, honestly, I mean, the first time I saw it, I knew it was her. Yeah, me too. But then they did the whole twist where she gets killed and you're like, what? Yeah. But so when the end came, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she does instigate it because the first time we're actually at the lift, like, so, uh, there's a lift and they're like, oh, you want to come in? And she's like, no, this one's too full. And the guy's like, no, you can. And she's being all, because she's like heavy racist as well. Like there's a lot of racist undertones with her yeah. um, through us. I mean, you picked up on that, right? Like, oh, yeah. It's not really subtle. Um, and yeah, she, she makes some remark or whatever. So she yeah, kind of made sure no, they all get into the same lift. So yeah, I mean, again, that wasn't really subtle or anything. But I still, I still love it. I still, I mean, sometimes it's nice to like, even not not have to think too much because I think what made this movie really good is the way that they actually filmed it. You know, oh, yeah. with the from the point of view inside the elevator where we actually have like the characters' point of views to the you know in the security office where they watch the footage. Like it's it's this you know like 
objective viewing versus subjective viewing almost. You know, I, I loved that. And I think that placed us more into the story and, you know, the switching between the, the different the, the different ways they shot it, which was really cool. I mean, I know we're going to talk about that, but, like, I think that's what worked for me. It's, I don't always want to watch a movie and have my brain break to try and figure stuff out. Like, you know, <laughs> this is just like one of those fun watch movies. Oh, they tell you everything. And I dig that about yeah. it. But imagine, I love it too. Imagine the nightmare of, so the guy who shot this, his name's Tak Fujimoto, and he won an Academy Award for Silence of the Lambs. So he's he's just big business in the industry. Yeah. And so they shot this in Toronto at a $10 million budget, and they shot it in 40 days. But just imagine the nightmare of making – well, so they had two elevators, one with a lot of blood and guts and one that looked a lot cleaner. And yeah. what, what they – but imagine just – and the actors wanted the claustrophobia as much as possible so they didn't remove as many of the walls as they could have during this time. So just and, – and also a lot of the cameramen were all wearing green so that could, they could be digitally taken out yeah. later, which is gnarly. But just imagine trying to storyboard this movie to try to make it visually interesting – and there's a couple neat things where they did where there's a scene where the older woman, she sits down on the ground and then it goes from her perspective looking up. And so they keep doing neat little things like that to keep it visually interesting. And as a film nerd and as someone who teaches film, I kept going, oh, my gosh, like, look at that. Uh, it's a little <laughs> weirdo $10 million movie that didn't make an effect much. It made like $60 million worldwide, which isn't bad. But I, I like how they did it. And I thought it was always visually interesting and I also, going back with that, with her, when she gets on there, she starts going at the guard, Bokeem Woodbine, his character Larson. She's like, where's your walkie-talkie? Where's this? Where's that? And she knows she stopped the elevator, and she's getting him pissed off. And then that creates tension in the thing. So she get, she kicks it right off the bat, just playing with Bokeem Woodbine's character to alienate him against everybody. It's a really neat yeah. thing. And then... I'm pretty sure she kills Vincent, the mattress salesman, because he annoys her the most first. Do you think that's why he she got rid of him first? Yeah, I do think so. He would probably have freaked out way too much, you know, as the body counts started to pile. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a good call from the devil to take him out first. <laughs> she hated, but she also, hated yeah. him. She just was like, I hate this guy. I'm going to, I'm going to wipe him out. Yeah. No, I mean, he was obvious first choice. I guess he was obvious first choice, right? Oh, he, oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he was always like, he, I love how he kept calling Bo Kim Woodbine's character dog and bro. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, it was actually, his character was well written. Um, I actually enjoyed his, his his lines. He had some yeah, he had some weird lines and weird way of speaking. It's, yeah, it's like your salesman or whatever, but he he did make it his own, which I kind of felt like yeah, he should go first. But also, ah, I mean, not a bad character. The characters weren't bad in general. I think my favorite line in this is when we learn that. They can hear the security guards talking to them, but the security guards can't hear them. So Matt Craven, the, one of the security guards, is named Lustig. He he's like, okay, guys, hang tough. And and then the Vincent, the salesman, goes, when's the last time you heard hang tough? And then the guy goes, what'd you say? And then he, uh, uh, nothing. And then like he's like, what'd you say? Is, is he starting a fight? Like that was funny. That was a good, well written little bit. <laughs> And I think that's the thing. Like, I mean, this movie wasn't like being all serious. And I think people were being way too serious about the movie, you know, because I think it just like kind of became a trend to dunk on anything Shyamalan's doing because, you know, he's had some like weird movies before this one. But yeah, I think you shouldn't, for anyone who wants to watch this movie, don't take it too seriously because it's actually really a lot of fun. I mean, the whole scene with the jelly dust. Come on. How can you take a movie seriously with that scene, you know? And, but it's, it gets the point across, doesn't it? It made me so happy exactly. with that. I love it. So uh, there's a, a place I, I used to write for, and I would always send in pitches about Devil, and they never got picked up, but it never stopped me from <laughs> doing it. I have sent Devil pitches to like, every publication known to man. And so I've like <laughs> I've tried to defend the jelly scene, 